welcome to this webinar about College of Europe and this webinar will be held in English. We are quite happy that more than 60 people have applied to join us today um, and we also hope that most of you will show up. We are recording this webinar so that people can see it afterwards. Um, it's good for you to know and you can spread the word to people around you so that they they, they won't miss anything. Um, my name is Eva Holmesteeg and I'm working as a coordinator for school ambassadors for the EU um, on the Swedish Council for Higher Education. I'm also working with administrating scholarships for Swedish students at College of Europe. This webinar will finish uh, at 10.45 uh, and if you have any questions during the webinar, please write them down in questions and, ask, uh, and answers, Q&A, below in the list, you, you can find that. Uh, we also have the ch chat function uh, in this Zoom webinar. Uh, and put your questions concerning technical issues. Uh, but now, I shouldn't be talking too much because I, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce and to welcome Mr. Alexander Leber. He's a senior academic assistant at College of Europe in Natalin, Poland. And five years ago, you were a student yourself. So you know what's it all about. Welcome. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's also my pleasure to be speaking to uh, to uh, the attendees today to spread the word about the College of Europe, uh, which is based indeed uh, on its two campuses, uh, the first one located in Bruges and the second one in Natalin. So uh, as you rightly pointed out, I myself was in the shoes of a student here first in Natalin and Warsaw before eventually being employed and now I've been uh, working as a, an academic assistant for already um, five years. Let me just share the screen so that we can go through the, um, the presentation that um, that is prepared for, for this purpose. Um, so um, the College of Europe is a postgraduate institute of European studies. Again, I'm coming from the Netherlands campus and since I'm an alumnus of, of this campus, I will mostly focus on Netherlands campus, but nevertheless, uh, I will also provide you with the information on the Bruges campus and the different uh, programs that are offered uh, at, at both campuses. So if we start with our history, why and, and, and how the College of Europe came into being, uh, the history goes back to the period uh, after the Second World War and uh, in, already in 1948 uh, at the Hague Congress, uh, there was an idea of, uh, of founding the College of Europe as an higher educational establishment where Europeans from uh, different countries would come together to study, to live, to discuss, uh, and to have this, uh, the College of Europe as an element of, um, of reconciliation and, and of uh, plan moving towards a peaceful, uh, prosperous future. So, uh, Based on the decision of the Hague Congress in 1949, the College of Europe was established in Bruges in Belgium, and this is where it continues to uh, to operate. Uh, then, uh, in light of the uh, <clears throat> end of the Cold War and then the, the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe uh, in 1992, uh, the second campus uh, was. Um, established in, in Warsaw, in Natalin. Uh, Natalin is a district in Warsaw, so this is where the campus uh, is located. So it is indeed within the boundaries of Warsaw. So that was in 1992. Uh, the, the pictures that are <clears throat> offered here, in the first one you can see the Hague Congress, the second one is the, op the opening ceremony of the Natalin campus in 1992, <clears throat> with uh, the then president of the European Commission, uh, Jacques uh, Delors. If we move forward, um, academic programs. So this slide, uh, I think, is the most important one uh, for, for those who consider applying to the college. So what are the academic programs that are offered at the college, both uh, in, in Bruges and in Natalin? Um, it's uh, essential to highlight that all of these are master's uh, programs. <clears throat> they all last one year. 
meaning every year in Natal in Edinburgh, we have an intake of new students. So there are no students who study for two or three years. So then when new students arrive, they can <clears throat> have colleagues who have already spent uh, a year or two on the campus. So this also helps um, uh, students to integrate because they're all new uh, to the college and they are in the same um, um, situation basically. So one year programs, advanced masters, uh, the college is accredited by Flemish authorities, uh, both campuses. Uh, so this is, this is the degree that, um, that then graduates uh, receive of advanced masters in different fields. Um, in terms of ECTS credits, um, all programs uh, follow the 66 ECTS credit scheme. And um, what is another important piece of information, um, the studies are conducted in English and French. Uh, the proportion between the languages, meaning how many courses are given, uh, are offered in English or in French also depends on the study program. But nevertheless, um, there is not a single program which wouldn't include uh, uh, some courses in, in, in both languages. So it's not possible to follow, let's say, any of the programs in just English or just French. There will also always be a mix, even if many courses are optional. So then students are to, to choose which ones they want to follow or not. Still, some of the compulsory parts of all programs in, in, in include um, uh, courses in, in, in both um, languages. So now academic programs. Um, so I start with Netherland campus. There is just one um, academic program which is uh, that is offered here. It's MA in European Interdisciplinary Studies, so Master of Arts in European Interdisciplinary Studies. And then you have here the four bullets, bullet points. And they refer to the specializations in the second semester. So uh, does not really matter which of the four uh, you decide to take in the second semester, still you are graduating with MA in European Interdisciplinary Studies. But the idea is that in the first semester, the courses are more of a general nature when it comes to European studies. And then in the second semester, as you can see, the choice is quite broad, ranging from EU public affairs and policies, meaning looking specifically into intra-EU affairs um, and different, uh, different fields of policies, uh, cohesion policy, digital economy, so on and so forth, to the EU and the world, how the EU is perceived in the world, how it acts on the international arena, then the EU and uh, its neighbors. Uh, here, the, the, the major, uh, this specialization um, is, is uh, looking into the neighbors of the EU, Eastern and Southern, 16 countries altogether and uh, the policy framework that the EU has developed towards these uh, countries and last but not least European history and civilization. So as you can see the choice is really diverse from intra-EU politics to uh, world global affairs, neighbors, but also history and civilization. When it comes to Bruges campus, uh, here you have four distinct um, master's programs. So it's a master in arts, um, Master of Arts in European Political and Governance Studies, then Master of Arts in EU International Relations and Diplomacy Studies, uh, then MSc in European Economic Studies and LLM in uh, European Law. So uh, the message of this slide is that uh, in Natalin there is one program, there is a possibility to specialize in the second semester. Uh, so it's European Interdisciplinary Studies uh, at the Bruges campus. Uh, already when you decide which program to follow, it's more specific. Uh, but then uh, since I'm, I'm going to focus mainly on Natalin campus, I will also explain to you how this interdisciplinary, uh, what's meant by European interdisciplinary studies and how this interdisciplinarity comes into play uh, with, uh, with the courses uh, that, that are offered here, uh, here at uh, Natalin. Um, let me go further. There is also Master of Arts in Trans Transatlantic Affairs, something that the College of Europe has been um, in implementing with uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, Boston, uh, for a few years already. So, uh, in contrast to the previous ones, to the uh, college per se, um, academic programs which all last one year. This is a two-year program so then 
uh, the student would need to spend one year at the college, uh, either Bruges or Natalin, and one year in, 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 then in Boston at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. The order can also be reversed, meaning the student can decide to start in the US and then uh, do the first year there, and then come to Europe to do the second year either in Natalin or Bruges, or the other way around, so the, there can be different uh, combinations of this. And uh, since it's a two-year program, it's 120 ECTS credit uh, program, and um, the uh, language of instruction in this case is English, and there are no courses in French. It also includes a high-level internship, and as I've told you already, it's available on both campuses in Natalin and Bruges. Uh, so uh, in contrast, again, um, to the programs that I have uh, uh, presented to you the programs that are given solely by the college. This is a cooperation with um, the American University, so it's longer and then um, it's students' choice where to start. Um, and it focuses on transatlantic affairs, something which is different from, from the previous ones because it prepares also graduates for positions of transatlantic uh, leadership. So here you would look into US-EU uh, relations uh, more precisely. Um, so now let me go into the, the part dealing with the Nathalie campus of the College of Europe. So again, it's Advanced Master of Arts in European Interdisciplinary Studies. And um, the aim of it is to provide a wider perspective on Europe uh, thanks to its interdisciplinarity. Uh, as you know, these days, most of the challenges are not coming from one specific sector, let's say, or they are not uh, affecting just one specific field of life, let's say, or economy. Uh, more and more, because of globalization and many other trends uh, in, in, in world affairs, the, uh, the processes happening are complex and they also require interdisciplinary approaches to see how a particular situation affects different spheres of life and then they also require some of the answers which cannot be found within one or two disciplines but rather from a um, compilation of methods coming from from uh, various disciplines uh, put together so uh, this is what inter interdisciplinarity of course simplified uh, stands for and uh, here uh, at Natalin students develop a large uh, range of skills uh, and are taught and encouraged to think beyond uh, boundaries so the picture here is a real picture of the Natalin campus this is the palace uh, which is located um, on the campus itself maybe this is a point where I need to say something more about the campus the campus is a closed area um, this uh, palace and the whole territory uh, used to be the hunting place of, of the Polish king and and then um, the, the government of Poland back in the 90s uh, when the negotiation about the establishment of a campus in Poland was undergoing um, offered this um, this area together with the palace uh, because the area itself is also national reserve national park which is closed uh, for uh, for outsiders and, and this is the area which is reserved specifically for, for the students and residences are also, student residences are uh, located uh, on, on the campus within, within this territory. So the, Pol the, the Polish government um, uh, gave the right to use um, these premises to, uh, to the College of Europe back in the 90s and this is how we operate. So the palace itself uh, is also real and, and um, very often um, on some of the uh, special days, opening ceremonies, so on and so forth, some of the uh, activities and celebrations take place uh, there. So now looking more specifically at the first semester, uh, the semester starts usually at the beginning of September. So the first se semester starts in September and it goes until uh, Christmas break. Uh, so now uh, our students uh, who uh, started their studies in September, uh, now is the last week of their courses, of the lectures they are uh, following, and then they will have a revision week, week and then from the beginning of December they will have exam session. Uh, first semester there are two study tracks and students can choose between two tracks, interdisciplinary track and the pluridisciplinary track. Um, 
Um, more specific information can be found on the uh, college website, but also if you have any of the questions relating to these tracks and how to, what types of courses um, they contain, then uh, you can also, you're also more than welcome to, to write those questions down. Uh, when it comes to study program, uh, these are some of the clusters of themes uh, that are uh, covered within the courses. These, these are not titles of the courses that are given in the first semester. So I'll just go through these uh, bullet points. So EU law and governance, European economic integration, uh, climate transition, energy governance, media, technology, politics, history, societies, identities, intercultural communication. Uh, but the idea behind the first semester is provide you with a, uh, with a fundamental knowledge relating to the European studies. Uh, therefore, courses uh, uh, like EU law order or EU economic governance, EU decision making and institutions, these are the ones uh, that, that, that are offered in the first uh, semester. Then in the second semester, something that I have already uh, mentioned, therefore I will probably uh, not spend too much time on it. There are four specializations that, that you can choose from. Um, the way it's done uh, in mid October, there is a uh, there is an online survey, and, and then students are invited to um, to select the specialization and then the courses within the specializations that uh, they want to uh, follow in the second semester. So within each specialization, there is still choice of courses. Uh, there is a number of courses that each and every student has to take since. Uh, uh, then the total number of ECTS credits should be 66. But for instance, if you are to follow six assessed courses in the second semester, then usually within the specialization, you have uh, 10 or 12, and then you, de you decide which ones, which six out of those 10 or 12 to, um, to enroll in. Uh, the study program in the second semester, 70 plus courses to choose from. So, you can also try maybe to calculate 70 divided by four. So this is more or less 15 uh, or more of different types of courses. When it comes to courses, um, they are not only uh, assessed courses uh, with exams, but also compact seminars, uh, also workshops and uh, simulation games uh, that are not non-assessed. So just to develop certain skills and to offer students the possibility to try themselves in in the role of a diplomat, let's say, negotiating a trade deal or uh, trying to find a solution to the lasting conflict uh, in the neighborhood. Um, in addition to the ones that I have already indicated, there is also cooperation with external partners. So there are several um, modules that we um, that we prepare with uh, in, in, in cooperation with, with the partners like the UN Refugee Agency, uh, the Red Cross, European Investment Bank, European University um, Institute. Now, when it comes to faculty teaching methodologies and resources, uh, something that is quite specific about the College of Europe, not only Natalin but Bruges, uh, is the flying faculty. So most of the professors who teach at the college are not based at the college, meaning they fly in, uh, they deliver, let's say, 10 hours of lectures, and then they fly out. So they go back to their home university. Um, and here in Natalin, we have more than 100 professors and practitioners, and they are coming from over 25 countries, mainly in, in Europe, but also we have some professors from the US and, and uh, Australia. Um, we have also introduced the blended learning in order to facilitate the learning process uh, at times of the pandemic when abruptly some of the travels can be cancelled and then professors cannot arrive. And as you can imagine, given this formula of flying faculty, uh, our institution is, is quite uh, also uh, needs to respond properly to some of the challenges that are occurring because if you have a uh, predominant majority of professors um, arriving, then you're heavily dependent also on, on their travel uh, uh, arrangements. Uh, On-site classes, so lectures, workshops, seminars, master classes, simulation games, something I mentioned already. So there are different types of classes. If you have any uh, outstanding questions relating to that, you can also uh, write them in the chat and then I'll be happy to.
to address those. We also have a library uh, when it comes to facilities that are available to students. So there's a library uh, uh, with a uh, catalog of more than 45,000 books. And we also have the access to some of the most important databases and uh, um, some of these sources relating to uh, to European studies uh, that that are of help, of course, uh, when you are preparing master thesis. Because apart from six, well, part of sixty six ECTS credits, these are courses, but also the master thesis. And both in Bruges and in Natalene, um, by the end of the of the year, students are supposed to submit. Uh, a master thesis. Um, as you can see here, the, the word limit is given in, in the parentheses just for your, uh, for your reference, uh, 12 to 18,000 words. Uh, so uh, this is also an obligation of a student not only to successfully pass the, um, the relevant exams um, that are part of the courses a student is registered for, but also to uh, to do a proper research and then to write master, th master thesis. Study trip, something we cherish, something we, uh, I probably say you even are proud of. Um, study trips is something that we have been also uh, implementing for a number of years. Uh, these are two one week long study trips, one per each academic semester. Um, the first one is usually the begin at the end of September. And the second uh, study trip is given in the second semester. So there is one study trip in the first semester, second study trip in the second semester. Um, so they are integral part of the EIS curriculum. We prepare our students to study trips. All study trips have a particular theme. And this is how then we choose speakers so that, so that you understand um, these are not guided visits uh, to particular cities. Of course, guided visits are part of the study trip, but study trips are mostly um, focused on meetings with relevant stakeholders in a given country. Um, because as you can see here in the map, usually uh, we go um, abroad for the study trips and these are the countries that have been visited on previous study trips. So uh, you will see some of the pictures taken at those study trips on some of the following slides. Uh, so when we go to Ukraine, let's say, uh, something that we did last year in September, we then meet with uh, some of the governmental officials, foreign diplomats, for instance, EU ambassador to Ukraine, representatives of NGOs, also academics, journalists, and then we have specific topic that we discuss with them. For instance, to what extent reforms happening in Ukraine are irreversible, what needs to be done. And then we look at different perspectives so that we grasp the idea and know better how it looks from Kyiv, for instance, not from Brussels or Bruges or Warsaw. So the idea also is to be part, well, to, to be on, on site uh, to visit some of the uh, prominent uh, sites relating to history and culture of, of the country uh, or countries in question because it doesn't have to be just one country uh, usually in the second semester the study trip uh, concerns uh, more than one country and there is this uh, idea of full immersion into topical issues on site with key experts and decision makers because we believe that um, it is it is not the same as bringing some of the experts, let's say, to, to not only to speak to students, but when you are in a country and then uh, you have this one week of quite specific uh, meetings and, and debates uh, with, with some of the prominent figures in, in civil society, uh, but also from the government, from let's say, external journalists, so on and so forth, so then you better understand what is going on and uh, uh, you can uh, yourself, uh, in a way, uh, contrast the perspectives uh, that are that are offered. If you look at the geography, you can see that uh, it's it, it goes from north to to south, west, and east, um, starting with let's say Finland and Baltic states, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg. Uh, we also travel to Tunisia, Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, and then Central Eastern Europe and then the Balkans. Um, these are some of the pictures taken uh, during those study trips. I have participated in some of these. So this is actually the one that I helped to organize. This was, I think, two years ago at the European External Action Service headquarters in Brussels. Um, then uh, this is the picture taken in, Vil in Vilnius, in Lithuania. 
a year ago, I suppose. This one is probably from Tunisia. Uh, this is the, the picture taken in Kyiv, uh, one of the main squares um, in Kyiv. I think the whole promotion was there, more than 100, maybe not the whole, but most students were there. 100 um, people and this is here on on the bottom uh, in the right corner you have the picture taken in front of the uh, famous Mostar uh, bridge in uh, in Mostar in in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina well uh, two years ago also with a study visit language is an intercultural dialogue on top of all of the courses of different uh, kind that are um, given to, to, to students for, to choose and uh, follow, uh, we have also languages. Yes? Oh, Alexandra, I don't want to in interrupt you. I just want to tell you that uh, there's four minutes left. All right, thank you a lot. Fine yes. with you. Yes, good. Great. Yes. So with the languages, there are eight languages that are offered. You can sign up and then follow these uh, language classes. At, they are offered at different levels. So you just, uh, there is a placement test after that. Uh, you in groups take part, uh, participate in those uh, group classes, but other also individual tutorials. So you can also continue to work on your languages, some of the languages that you have already started to, to learn, but also you can start new ones. And careers and professional development, we also have a careers office, so they, they can help you with preparing CVs and looking into your career prospects. Uh, some of our alumni coming from Natalin are Rafa Trzaskowski, he is a mayor of Warsaw these days, also Maria Pejcinovic Buric, Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Alan Smith, Member of Parliament in the UK, and this is a quote by the Secretary General, time spent there is an investment in the future. This is the employment, the employment sectors. So I think it's, it's important to mention where then the graduates find themselves in terms of career prospects. So here you can see how it is. A quarter is employed in companies, consultancies, trade associations, the same amount, more or less, in EU institutions, EU agencies. Then you have academic institutions, public sector, law firms, international organizations, NGOs, so on and so forth. First class academic environment. We have two academic chairs here in terms of research and also how they uh, operate within the academic world, how the world knows about uh, here, Natalin more specifically, because these both chairs are uh, um, um, here. So they also organize different events. They, they also uh, do research and, and then publish it in, uh, in the well-known. There are also Natalin nests on energy, climate, governance, academy of migration and digital and media, something that students are invited also to be part of and then um, together with the coordinator to prepare different events relating to those topics. Uh, apart from that, there are also special lectures that we organize and these are some of the guests who uh, agreed to come and to speak to our students in the past. Uh, Madeleine Albright, former US Secretary of State, Jose Borrell, back then he was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, now he is the High Representative of, of the Union uh, for foreign, and affairs, foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Michel Barnier, back then and now Chief Negotiator of the EU for Brexit talks, um, Francois Hollande, Hollande. Uh, back then he was already former French President, and then uh, there was also a lady from, from the UN, uh, quite high-ranking official dealing with climate change. Um, student and campus life at Natalin. So at Natalin, there's one program every year, new intake of students, around 130 students coming from over 30 countries. And um, what we offer in terms of facilities, so we have accommodation here, a single room for every student, Natalin restaurant with full board seven days per week, indoor, outdoor sports facilities. Some of the pictures I'm going now to skip them unique campus a dynamic city because it's quite close to the city center it's i think 20 minutes by by uh, subway by metro to go to the uh, to the city center and natalie in itself a historic picturesque 120 hectare natural reserve and it's all for the students so you see actually taken uh, on the campus and yes we do have wild animals um, uh, that can also visit um, the students. Now, um, 
I have also these slides probably uh, I will now go to the admissions because I don't have uh, enough time but then if there are questions about COVID situation how we managed it then I will go back to those so admissions uh, are open already so there is a web page where you can already submit your application the deadline is the 13th of January 2021 when you create your profile you can uh save it and then work on it later but what's important is that you are done with the whole application and you click on submit before the 13th of january academic requirements so there needs to be a relevant university degree uh, bologna master's degree or equivalent 240 cts's so in some countries ba programs last four years so then those uh, graduates have 240 cts's and they can apply if it's a three-year BA, usually it's less than 240 ECTSs, then uh, that applicant would need to first uh, obtain master's degree somewhere else before being able to apply to the college. But in exceptional cases, bachelor degree uh, only uh, is also fine. In terms of language proficiency, since it's a bilingual institution with courses both in English and French, English level minimum is B2, and then French level uh, minimum is A2, B1. And in Natalin, we also have the Summer Language Academy, uh, three weeks of intensive language uh, classes, either French or English, happening before the start of the academic year, meaning in, in August. So then you can also use it to improve your language before the start of the academic year. Um, student profiles. Um, so when it comes to Natalin, as the program is interdisciplinary, it's not that you have to have diploma in political science or international relations. As you can see here, many of our <clears throat> students studied in the past linguistics, journalism, geography, even natural sciences or engineering. So there is no uh, requirement, uh, well, quite, there is a strict requirement as to what kind, what field of study you need to come to, uh, to come from to, in order to be uh, eligible. Um, and uh, fees, something that is important as well. So the year at the college, Bruges and Natalin, uh, costs uh, 26,000 euros, tuition fees 17,000, board and lodging fees 9,000 9, euros. This is how it is. And at Natalin, you can see what these fees cover. Um, tuition registration examination, two study trips that we uh, spoke about, fully covered, summer language academy, English or French language proficiency certificates, and uh, boarding and lodging fees cover accommodation, private room and cleaning service, then meals, as I mentioned, medical private insurance, uh, Wi-Fi connections, port facilities. And in relation to fees, one of the last uh, slides, there are also uh, different scholarships that are open to uh, applicants from uh, various countries and uh, this is the actual figure more than 70 percent of our students are awarded full or partial scholarships by their national governments private actors or by the college of europe itself thanks to the support of european uh, institution and here on this slide uh, you can see some of the uh, some of the countries that uh, that have specific scholarship schemes but there are also um, schemes that uh, are not national in a way, but are provided by the, let's say, European Commission or some other institutions. So here, if you look at ENP scholarships for EU citizens, so they are open to all EU citizens, can be full or partial, you just need to show interest in the ENP, provide the motivation letter, and then attribution is based on motivation and merit. So uh, also in this ENP scholarship scheme refers both to Bruges and Natalin. When it comes to Natalin, we also have this history scholarship and journalism scholarship here. Nationality doesn't really uh, matter when it comes to history scholarship. For journalism, EU and ENP citizens can also apply for this and this way to have full or partial scholarship. With history, you need to be graduate in history or related disciplines, and then you need to provide motivation letter. Um, attribution based on the same criteria in journalism. These are journalists or people who have clear background and interest in media and uh, journalism. Um, and I think this is the last one. Um, and probably I will just uh, stop here. Um, when in the application itself, uh, you can choose both, you can, you can choose two programs and then decide which one takes preference. So within the same application, you can actually apply to, 
two different programs. Uh, this is how it is. And these are the requirements, what you need to upload onto the portal in order to be able to submit the, um, the application. So CV motivation letters, scholarship application in case you're applying for a scholarship, diplomas and transcripts to recommendation letters, language proficiency certificates. Um, and then there is no application fee. So basically the application itself is, is not uh, paid. Uh, and then there is this pre-selection interviews. Then if uh, we go through your file and we think that you are a good candidate, then there is an interview uh, in spring 2021. And then the decision is taken uh, later, first on admissions and then on scholarship. And uh, yeah, and this is our uh, motto, widen your perspective at the Natalin campus. And uh, so thank you for your attention and I'm now ready to uh, address any of the questions that have been uh, raised. Thank you, Alexander. It was very interesting. I wish I was 25 myself and could apply for it. <laughs> Though we have a, a few questions here. Um, and one is about the, uh, how does College of Europe regard the risk of lockdown concerning COVID-19? Thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is on the slides that I intentionally uh, uh, skipped. Um, so uh, when it comes to lockdown, this is something we already experienced in the second semester of the previous academic year in, in March and, uh, and April. I don't think it was here, or was it later? Um, let me see where it was here. Um, so um, the students back then, at least, uh, had a choice either to stay on the campus or to go back home to the extent it was possible because there were also travel restrictions. And then um, all of the activities were moved online. So we mostly used uh, Zoom for the lectures because again, with flying faculty, uh, professors couldn't arrive in Natolin. And also because of the national law restrictions, uh, lectures either way wouldn't uh, have been organized on site. So uh, then still full board and everything was provided on the campus for the students who stayed and uh, students could, could connect to those lectures uh, using Zoom from their respective um, individual rooms. Um, as you can see here, strict sanitary measures were introduced based on guidelines. Also, we have an in-house expert in epidemic safety. So it when it comes to this academic year, we did some of the, so this, these are the comments of uh, graduates from last year. Uh, so we managed to, um, to finish the academic year on time, thanks also to the responsible approach of the students. And uh, this academic year, we already did, um, I think, the second testing of students uh, when it comes to COVID. First, they had to do the test at home before arrival, and they had to provide us with a negative PCR test before they arrive uh, on the campus. And then after the study trips uh, that we still had this year, um, two weeks, I think, after, after those, we had um, a second, um, second round of, um, of testing. And now we have also implemented um, and, and are working on this blended learning approach so that in case there is a lockdown, uh, instead of just moving fully uh, on Zoom, we would have some parts of courses uh, available in the form of, let's say, interactive pre-recorded lectures or some other content which is that is available on the platform. Uh, so uh, this is um, how it is. I hope this and of course. The for the future, we can't tell really what's happening next year for the students who apply now in, in January concerning uh, COVID-19. That's true to a certain extent, but uh, also in April, we didn't know what would happen in September. Uh, still, I don't think there was, uh, of course, there were different discussions and uh, the, the, were, uh, the, the task force was also uh, uh, created uh, in order to see how to uh, then uh, to make sure that we conduct the academic year in a way that is safe, but also uh, uh, ensuring that the environment which is created is inducive to, to, uh, to learning process. And uh, the students arrived in both campuses. Uh, I think all students but one arrived actually before the first day of the academic year. There was one student who experienced problems with uh, some of the flights being cancelled, but other than that, uh, we made sure that uh, we took all of the necessary precautionary measures uh, 
and uh, that students are safe on the campus. And again, since it's a closed campus, closed from outsiders, uh, if we test students, but we also tested staff. So if we test students and staff, we, and still even in classrooms these days, uh, when we are we're having some some lectures still with professors connecting via Zoom, but students are in the classroom, there is this distance between chairs. Also, they need to wear masks outside, uh, so on and so forth. In the canteen, there are spe specific uh, regulations that, that ended so that there is not so much of social uh, interaction. So with testing, knowing that this is a closed campus, we can be uh, more or less certain that uh, we uh, can uh, stay healthy. It is unpredictable. Yes, it sounds good. We also have a question about languages. Uh, do you need to speak both English and French to be able to apply and study at the college? And I think you've already answered that during your presentation, but you also mentioned that you have a summer language academy. Um, it would yes. be interesting just to hear some, we don't have many minutes left and I should tell the participants some, something about the Swedish scholarships, but um, it, I'll, I'll just it maybe say fluent in both when you apply uh, yes. college. Yes, um, when it comes to language requirements, so for both Bruges and Natalin, English and French, these the ones that are in this slide. This is for Natalin. Most of the courses are taught in English, therefore English level has to be B2 minimum. When it comes to French, you see the minimum requirement is A2 or B1. So A2 or B1 is still not fluent, as you can imagine, uh, based on the classification that is offered by the Council of Europe. So there is this Natalin Summer Language Academy, but we also uh, encourage our applicants to work on, on, let's say, French if they think that they need to improve it. Uh, before participating in this uh, Natalin Summer Language Academy. So indeed there is a possibility to participate in this Language Summer Academy uh, to have three weeks of, let's say, French intensive uh, weeks, uh, but also uh, it is important to work on, on French independently. So the, the answer to the question is no, you don't have to be fluent in both English and French. When it comes to Bruges programs, it's better to go to the website because, uh, for instance, in the law department, a law program has a lot of courses in French simply because it's the language that is used by the, uh, the Court of Justice of the EU. So they have also terminology and many courses, many more courses in French. So I suppose their requirement when it comes to French will be a bit stricter than ours. So this is the minimum minimum. You are encouraged to work on your French independently and then also participate in the language summer academy. We also have a question about when to apply. Is there an advantage to apply early, like in, in October, compared to sending the application in January? Um, there's no advantage because uh, we only look uh, into the applications after the deadline, meaning uh, then in mid-January, when all applications are closed, we only then download them and uh, academic assistance, we are 10 here at, at Natalin, but also academic assistance at Bruges, then uh, look into each and every of these applications and uh, we don't look at when the application was filed. It's not first come, first served. It's, it's again, as was mentioned as several, on several occasions, it's merit-based. So what is important is that your application is properly submitted by the 13th of January. It does not uh, make a difference if you submit it in October, November, December. Just make sure it is submitted by the, by the deadline because what happens, and this is something we observe, sometimes applicants create profiles, they work on the application, and then it is sometimes the case then they just forget to click on submit or the, the application is 80% done or 90% done and then uh, the applicant somehow didn't go back to it to just finish and submit. So make that's, sure you submit. That's a shame. Make sure that you click so that, that the application will, will go to the college. That's a good advice. Um, we don't have much time left, but I, I would like to to tell people that, um, first of all, 
First of all, I would like to thank you, Alexandra, for a, a very interesting presentation. And as I mentioned, I, I would love to go there myself, but I'm, I'm getting too old now. Um, remember to apply before the 13th of January. Uh, and you do that through uh, the website College of Europe. Um, perhaps we should ask Asya to put the first, the welcoming uh, picture, um, presentation where you can see the, the email address if you want to have any, if you have any questions and you want to get in touch with us afterwards. Um, I, this have, uh, I have um, um, copied them in the chat. So all the links and mail email addresses are in the chat. Very good. So watch the chat for, for all the links and the email addresses. The Swedish state has scholarships um, uh, for a maximum of 100,000 Swedish crowns, uh, which is to support living expenses like board and lodging. Uh, you, Alexander, mentioned there is a possibility to apply for other scholarships from the EU. That's true, yes. Do, do you have to apply for them separately or, or do you do you try to get them once you send in your application? Uh, there are specific fields and the application itself. So there will be a field saying ENP scholarship for EU citizens. So then if you are interested, you are to provide the motivation letter why you want to um, to get this uh, scholarship. So uh, there is no separate platform or the application itself to the college, but also application for scholarships is done via the same, uh, the same portal. It's just in the specific fields, uh, you need either to write a motivation letter, which would then mean that you are applying for the scholarship. Because when it comes to, to the Swedish, Swedish citizens, so this can be uh, ENP uh, scholarship, both in Bruges and Natalin. An uh, ENP meaning you need to demonstrate your interest in EU relations with Eastern partnership countries or Southern uh, neighborhood countries. Uh, so then you would need to write this additional uh, motivation letter. Or there is uh, this uh, scholarship offered by the Natalin campus for, uh, for historians. So then here nationality doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, play a role, but again, then motivation letter needs to be simply added in the specific field. So just be, well, be careful and, and pay attention to the application itself, because in certain fields, uh, by inserting the motivation letter, you are applying for the, uh, for the scholarship. And uh, concerning the Swedish scholarships, you don't have to apply extra for that. Um, once you get into the College of Europe, you will, you will, uh, we will get a list with the uh, students from Sweden and we'll put the money. So you don't have to, to you don't need to apply extra for this. It's good to know. Um, what else? Time's running out. We are a bit delayed now, <laughs> but uh, we will publish this link, link to the webinar in a few days and you will find it on our website, uh, uhr.se uhr.se um, and you can search for College of Europe and you will find this this webinar if you want to see it afterwards as well. Uh, well let's stay in tune and good luck with your applications and once again thank you for telling us all about College of Europe.